Once upon a time in the city of Matilla, there was a king who had two sons. The older one was named Bad Fruit, and his younger brother was called Poor Fruit. While they were still fairly young, the king made his older son the crown prince. He was second in command and next in line to the throne. Prince Poorfruit became commander of the army. Eventually the old king died and Prince Badfruit became the new king. Then his brother became crown prince. Before long, a certain servant <laughs> took a disliking to crown Prince Poorfruit. He went to King Badfruit and told a lie that his brother was planning to kill him. At first the king did not believe him, but after the servant kept repeating the lie, the king became frightened. So he had Prince Poorfruit put in chains and locked up in the palace dungeon. The prince thought, I am a righteous man, was does not deserve these chains. I never wanted to kill my brother. I wasn't even angry at him. So now I call on the power of truth. If what I say is true, may these chains fall off and the dungeon doors be opened. Miraculously, the chains broke in pieces, the door opened, and the prince fled to an outlying village. The people there recognized him. Since they respected him, they helped him, and the king was unable to capture him. Even though he lived in hiding, the crown prince became the master of the entire remote region. In time, he raised a large army. He thought, although I was not an enemy to my brother at first, I must be an enemy to him now. So he took his army and surrounded the city of Mithila. He sent a message to King Badfruit. I was not your enemy, but you have made me so. Therefore, I have come to wage war against you. I give you a choice. Either give me your crown and kingdom, or come out and fight. Hearing of this, most of the city people went out and joined the prince. King Badfruit decided to wage war. He would do anything to keep his power. Before going out with his army, he went to say goodbye to his number one queen. She was expecting a baby very soon. He said to her, My love, no one knows who will win this war. Therefore, if I die, you must protect the child inside you. Then he bravely went off to war and was quickly killed by the soldiers of his enemy brother. The news of the king's death spread through the city. The queen disguised herself as a poor, dirty, homeless person. She put on old rags for clothes and smeared dirt on herself. She put some of the king's gold and her own most precious jewelry into a basket. She covered these with dirty rice that no one would want to steal. Then she left the city by the northern gate. Since she had always lived inside the city, the queen had no idea where to go from there. She had heard of a city called Kampa. She sat down at the side of the road and began asking if anyone was going to Kampa. It just so happened that the one who was about to be born was no ordinary baby. This was not his first life or his first birth. Millions of years before, he had been a follower of a long-forgotten teaching Buddha, a fully enlightened one. He had wished with all his heart to become a Buddha just like his beloved master. He was reborn in many lives. Sometimes as poor animals, sometimes as long-living gods, and sometimes as human beings. He always tried to learn from his mistakes and develop the ten perfections. This was so he could purify his mind and remove the three root causes of unwholesomeness, the poisons of craving, anger, and the delusion of a separate self. By using the perfections, he would someday be able to replace the poisons with the three purities, non-attachment, loving-kindness, and wisdom. This great being had been a humble follower of the forgotten Buddha. His goal was to gain the same enlightenment of a Buddha, the experience of complete truth, so people called him Bodhisattva, which means enlightenment being. 
No one really knows about the millions of lives lived by this great hero. But many stories have been told, including this one about a pregnant queen who was about to give birth to him. After many more rebirths, he became the Buddha who is remembered and loved in all the world today. At the time of our story, the Enlightenment being had already achieved the ten perfections. So the glory of his coming birth caused a trembling in all the heaven worlds, including the heaven of 33, ruled by King Saka. When he felt the trembling, being a god, he knows it was caused by the unborn babe inside the disguised Queen of Mithila. And he knew this must be a being of great merit. So he decided to go and help out. King Saka made a covered carriage with a bed in it and appeared at the roadside in front of the pregnant queen. He looked just like an ordinary old man. He called out, Does anyone need a ride to Kampa? The homeless queen answered, I wish to go there, kind sir. Come with me then, the old man said. Since the birth was not far off, the pregnant queen was quite large. She said, I cannot climb up into your carriage. Simply carry my basket and I will walk behind. The old man, the king of the gods, replied, Never mind. Never mind, I am the cleverest driver around, so don't worry, just step into my cart. Lo and behold, as she lifted her foot, King Saka magically caused the ground under her to rise up. So she easily stepped down into the carriage. Immediately, she knew this must be a god, and fell fast asleep. Saka drove the cart until he came to a river. Then he awakened the lady and said, Wake up, daughter and bathe in this river. Dress yourself in this fine clothing I've brought you. Then eat a packet of rice. She obeyed him, and then lay down and slept some more. In the evening, she awoke and saw tall houses and walls. She asked, What is this city, father? He said, This is Kampa. King Saka replied, I took a shortcut. Now that we are at the southern gate of the city, you may safely enter in. I must go on to my own far-off village. So they parted, and Saka disappeared in the distance, returning to his heaven world. The queen entered the city and sat down at an inn. There happened to be a wise man living in Kampa. He recited spells and gave advice to help people who were sick or unfortunate. While on his way to bathe in the river with five hundred followers, he was the beautiful queen from a distance. The great goodness of the unborn one within gave her a soft, warm glow, which only the wise man noticed. At once he felt a kind and gentle liking for her, just as if Ware were his own youngest sister. So he left his followers outside and went into the inn. He asked her, Sister, what village are you from? She replied, I am the number one queen of King Badfruit of Mithila. He asked, Then why did you come here? My husband was killed by the army of his brother, Prince Porfruit, she said. I was afraid, so I ran away to protect the unborn one within me. The wise man asked, Do you have any relatives in this city? She said, No, sir. Then he said, Don't worry at all. I was born in a rich family, and I myself am rich. I will care for you just as I would for my own young sister. Now you must call me brother and grab hold of my feet and cry out. When she did this, the followers came inside. The wise man explained to them that she was his long-lost youngest sister. He told his closest followers to take her to his home in a covered cart. He told them to tell his wife that this was his sister who was to be cared for. They did exactly as he had said. The wife welcomed her, gave her a hot bath, and made her rest in bed. After bathing in the river, the wise man returned home. At dinner time, he asked his sister to join them. After dinner, he invited her to stay in his home. In only a few days, the queen gave birth to a wonderful little baby boy. 
She named him Fruitful. She told the wise man this was the name of the boy's grandfather, who had one been king of Mithila. The baby grew into a little boy. His friends took to making fun of him for not being of high-class birth like they were. So he went and asked his mother who his father was. She told him to pay no attention to what the other children said. She told him his father was the dead King Bad Fruit of Mithila and how his brother, Prince Poor Fruit, had stolen the throne. After that, it didn't bother him when the others called him son of a widow. Before he was sixteen, the bright young Fruitful learned all there was to know about religion, literature, and the skills of a warrior. He grew into a very handsome young man. He decided it was time to regain his rightful crown, which had been stolen by his uncle. So he went and asked his mother, Do you have any of the wealth that belonged to my father? She said, Of course, I did not escape empty-handed. Thinking of you, I brought pearls, jewels, and diamonds. So there is a need for you to work for pay. Go directly and take back your kingdom. But he said, No, mother, I will take only half. I will sail to Burma, the land of gold, and make my fortune there. His mother said, No, my son, it is too dangerous to sail abroad. There is plenty of fortune here, he said. I must leave half with you, my mother, so you can live in comfort as a queen should. So saying, he departed by ship for Burma. On the same day that Prince Fruitful set sail, his uncle King Poorfruit became very ill. He was so sick that he could no longer leave his bed. Meanwhile, on the ship bound for Burma, there were some 350 people. It sailed for seven days. Then there was a violent storm that damaged and weakened the ship. All except the prince cried out in fear and prayed for help to their various gods. But the Bodhisattva did not cry out in fear. The Enlightenment being did not pray to any god for help. Instead, he helped himself. He filled his belly with concentrated butter mixed with sugar, since he didn't know how long it would be before his next meal. He soaked his clothes in oil to protect himself from the cold ocean water and help him stay afloat. Then when the ship began to sink, he went and held on to the mast, for it was the tallest part of the ship. As the deck sank underwater, he pulled himself up the mast. Meanwhile, his trembling praying shipmates were sucked underwater and gobbled up by hungry fish and huge turtles. Soon, the water all around turned red from blood. As the ship sank, Prince Fruitful reached the top of the mast. To avoid being devoured in the sea of blood, he jumped mightily from the tip of the mast in the direction of the kingdom of Mithila. And at the same time as he saved himself from the snapping jaws of the fish and turtles, King Poorfruit died in his bed. After his mighty leap from the top of the mast, the prince fell into the emerald-coloured sea. He body shined like gold as he swam for seven days and seven nights. Then he saw it was the fasting day of the full moon. So he purified his mouth by washing it out with salt water and observed the eight training steps. Once upon a time, in the very distant past, the gods of the four directions had appointed a goddess to be the protector of the oceans. They had told her that her duty was to protect especially all those who honor and respect their moths and other elders. All such who did not deserve to fall into the sea were to be protected by her. It just so happened that Prince Fruitful was one who deserved the protection of the ocean goddess. But for the seven days and seven nights that he had been swimming through the sea, the goddess had not been paying attention and doing her duty. She had been too busy enjoying heavenly pleasures to remember to keep watch on the oceans. Finally, she remembered her duty and looked over the oceans. Then she was the golden prince struggling in the Emerald Sea after seven days and seven nights of swimming. She thought, 
If I let this Prince Fruitful die in the ocean, I will no longer be welcome in the company of the gods. For truly, he is the enlightenment being. So she took on a form of splendor and beauty and floated in the air near him. Wishing to learn truth from him, she asked, without seeing the shore of the ocean, why are you trying to reach the ocean's end? Hearing those words, the prince thought, for the seven days I've been swimming, I have met no one who can this be. When he saw the goddess above him, he said, O oh, lovely goddess, I know that a fort is the way of the world. So as long as I am in this world, I will try and try, even in mid ocean with no shore to be seen. Wishing to learn more from him, she tested him by saying, This vast ocean stretches much farther than you can see without reaching a shore. Your effort is useless, for here you must die. The prince replied, Dear goddess, how can effort be useless? For he who never gives pea trying cannot be blamed, either by his relatives here below or by the gods above, so he has no regrets. No matter how impossible it seems, if he stops trying, H causes his own downfall. Pleased with his answers, the protecting goddess tested him one last time. She asked, Why do you continue when there really is no reward to be gained except pain and death. He answered her again, like a teacher to a pupil. It is the way of the world that people make plans and try to reach their goals. The plans must succeed for fail. Only time will tell. But the value is in the effort itself in the present moment. And besides, O oh goddess, can't you see that my actions have already brought results? My shipmates only prayed and they are dead. But I've been swimming for seven days and seven nights, and lo and behold, here you are, floating above me. So I will swim with all my might, even across the whole ocean, to reach the shore. While I have an ounce of strength, I'll try and try again. Completely satisfied, the ocean goddess who protects the good said, You who bravely fight the mighty ocean against hopeless odds. You who refuse to run from the task before you. Go wherever your heart desires. For you have my protection and no one can stop you. Just tell me where I may carry you to. The prince told her he wished to go to Mithila. The goddess gently lifted him like a bouquet of flowers and laid him on her chest, like a loving mother with a newborn babe. Then she flew through the air while the enlightenment being slept, cradled against her heavenly body. Arriving at Mithila, she laid him on a sacred stone in a garden of mangoes and told the garden goddesses to watch over him. Then the protector goddess of the oceans returned to her heaven world home. The dead king, poor fruit had left behind only a daughter, no sons. She was well educated and wise, and her name was Princess Sivali. When the king was dying, the ministers asked him, who will be the next king? King Poorfruit said, whoever can satisfy my daughter Sivali, whoever recognizes the head of the royal square bed, whoever can string the bow that only a thousand men can string, or whoever can find the sixteen hidden treasures. After the funeral of the king, the ministers began searching for a new king. First they looked for one who could satisfy the princess. They called for the general of the army. Princess Sivali wished to test him so Mithila could be ruled by a strong leader. She told him to come to her. Immediately he ran up the royal staircase. She said, to prove your strength, run back and forth in the palace. Thinking only of pleasing her, the general ran back and forth until she motioned for him to stop. Then she said, now! Jump up and down. Again, the general did as he was told without thinking. Finally, the princess told him, Come here and massage my feet. He sat in front of her and began rubbing her feet. 
Suddenly, she put her foot against his chest and kicked him down the royal staircase. She turned to her ladies in waiting and said, This fool has no common sense. He thinks the only strength is in running around and jumping up and down and following orders without thinking. He has no strength of character. He lacks the willpower needed to rule a kingdom. So throw him out of here at once. Later the general was asked about his meeting with Princess Sivali. He said, I don't want to talk about it. She is not human. The same thing happened with the treasurer, the cashier, the keeper of the royal seal and the royal swordsman. The princess found them all to be unworthy fools. So the ministers decided to give up on the princess and find someone who could string the bow that only a thousand men can string. But again, they could find no one. Similarly, they could find no one who knew the head of the royal square bed or who could find the 16 treasures. The ministers became more and more worried that they could not find a suitable king. So they consulted the royal family priest. He said to them, calm down, my friends. We will send out the royal festival carriage. The one it stops for will be able to rule over all India. So they decorated the carriage and yoked the four most beautiful royal horses to it. The high priest sprinkled the carriage with holy water from a sacred golden pitcher. He proclaimed, Now go forth, riderless carriage, and find the worthy one with enough merit to rule the kingdom. The horses pulled the carriage around the palace and then down the main avenue of Mithila. They were followed by the four armies, the elephants, chariots, cavalry, and foot soldiers. The most powerful politicians of the city expected the procession to stop in front of their houses. But instead, it left the city by the eastern gate and went straight to the mango garden. Then it stopped in front of the sacred stone where Prince Fruitful was sleeping. The chief priest said, let us test this sleeping man to see if he is worthy to be king. If he is the one, he will not be frightened by the noise of the drums and instruments of all four armies. So they made a great clanging noise, but the prince just turned over on his other side, remaining asleep. Then they made the noise again, even louder. Again, the prince simply rolled over from side to side, the head priest examined the soles of the feet of the sleeping one, he said, this man can rule not only Mithila, but the whole world in all four directions. So he awakened the prince and said, my lord, arise, we beg you to be our king. Prince Fruitful replied, what happened to your king? He died, said the priest. Did he have any children? Asked the prince. Only a daughter, Princess Sivali, answered the priest. Then Prince Fruitful agreed to be the new king. The chief priest spread jewels on the sacred stone. After bathing, the prince sat among the jewels. He was sprinkled with perfumed water from the gold anointing bowl. Then he was crowned King Fruitful. The new king rode in the royal chariot, followed by a magnificent procession, back to the city of Mithila and the palace. Princess Sivali still wished to test the king. So she sent a man to tell him she wished him to come at once. But King Fruitful ignored him, simply continuing to inspect the palace with its furnishings and works of art. The messenger told this to the princess, and she sent him back two more times with the same results. He reported back to her, This is a man who knows his own mind, not easily swayed. He paid as little attention to your words as we pay to the grass when we step on it. Soon, the king arrived at the throne room where the princess was waiting. He walked steadily up the royal staircase, not hurrying, not slowing down, but dignified like a strong young lion. The princess was so impressed by his attitude that she went to him, respectfully gave him her hand and led him to the throne. He gracefully sat on the throne, then he asked the royal ministers, did the previous king leave behind any advice for testing the next king? Yes, Lord, they said. 
whoever can satisfy my daughter, Sivali. The king responded, You have seen the princess give me her hand. Was there another test? They said, well, Whoever recognizes the head of the royal square bed. The king took a golden hairpin from his head and gave it to Princess Sivali, saying, Put this away for me. Without thinking, she put it on the head of the bed. As if he had not heard it the first time, King Fruitful asked the ministers to repeat the question. When they did, he pointed to the golden hairpin. Was there another test? asked the king. Yes, Lord, replied the ministers. Whoever can string the bow that only a thousand men can string. When they brought the bow, the king strung it without even rising from the throne. He did it as easily as a woman bends the rod that untangles cotton for spinning. Are there any more tests? the king asked. The minister said, Whoever can find the sixteen hidden treasures. These are the last tests. What is the first on the list? he asked. They said, The first is the treasure of the rising sun. King Fruitful realized that there must be some trick to finding each treasure. He knew that a silent Buddha is often compared to the glory of the sun. So he asked, Where did the king go to meet and feed silent Buddhas? When they showed him the place, he had them dig up the first treasure. The second was the treasure of the setting sun. King Fruitful realized this must be where the old king had said goodbye to silent Buddhas. In the same manner he found all the hidden treasures. The people were happy that he had passed all the tests. As his first official act, he had houses of charity built in the center of the city and at each of the four gates. He donated the entire sixteen treasures to be given to the poor and needy. Then he sent for his mother, Queen of the Dead King Badfruit, and also for the kind, wise man of Kampa. He gave them both the honor they deserved. All the people of the kingdom came to Mithila to celebrate the restoration of the royal line. They decorated the city with fragrant flower garlands and incense. They provided cushioned seats for visitors. There were fruits, sweets, drinks, and cooked foods everywhere. The ministers and the wealthy brought musicians and dancing girls to entertain the king. There were beautiful poems recited by wiser men and blessings chanted by holy men. The enlightened being, King Fruitful, sat on the throne under the royal white umbrella. In the midst of the great celebration, he seemed as majestic as the heavenly god, King Saka. He remembered his great effort, struggling in the ocean against all odds, when even the ocean goddess had abandoned him. Only because of that almost hopeless effort, he himself was now as magnificent as a god. This filled him with such joy that he spoke this rhyme. Things happen unexpectedly, and prayers may not come true. But effort brings results that neither thoughts nor prayers can do. The tale of King Fruitful resonates with layers of profound meaning, akin to the flowing currents of ancient wisdom that transcend time and culture. At its core, this saga embodies universal themes that offer insights into the human experience and the nature of existence, resilience, and destiny. One of the central motifs of the tale lies in resilience, the unwavering determination of the protagonist, fruitful, to reclaim what is rightfully his. It portrays the human spirit's ability to endure adversity and navigate the turbulent seas of life. His journey signifies the dance between fate and human agency, showcasing how resilience intertwines with destiny in shaping one's path. The Cycle of Triumph and Adversity The tale weaves a narrative tapestry where triumph and adversity coalesce, echoing the cyclical nature of existence. Fruitful's rise to rulership emerges from a sequence of challenges and tests, a reflection of life's trials that shape our character and destiny. It underlines the idea that adversity often paves the way for growth, resilience, and ultimate triumph. 
divine intervention and cosmic harmony. The celestial elements and divine interventions within the tale reflect the Eastern concept of cosmic harmony and the interconnectedness of mortal and celestial realms. The guidance from celestial beings hints at the subtle interplay between the seen and unseen forces, suggesting a harmonious orchestration guiding human destinies. Wisdom, virtue, and leadership. Fruitful's journey embodies the qualities of a virtuous leader. Wisdom, integrity, and compassion. His ascent to kingship signifies the emergence of a leader committed to righteousness and the welfare of his people. The narrative extols the virtues of ethical leadership, emphasizing the importance of wisdom and integrity in governance, eternal cycles, and continuity. Through the promise of continuity embodied by Prince Longlife, the tale highlights the cyclical nature of life, a continuous cycle of birth, growth, and succession. It symbolizes the perpetuation of legacies and the passing of wisdom and values from one generation to the next. Ultimately, the tale of King Fruitful serves as a mirror to the human condition, an allegory that invites introspection into the intricacies of life's trials, the resilience of the human spirit, and the quest for reclaiming one's destiny. It implores us to contemplate the interplay of fate and action, the virtues of resilience and wisdom, and the eternal cycles that shape our existence. And so, my dear friends, as we come to the closing chapter of this enthralling saga, let us take a moment to ponder the wondrous tapestry of existence unveiled in the tale of King Fruitful. In the enchanting dance between destiny and human endeavor, we find a reflection of our own lives filled with trials, tribulations, and moments of sublime triumph. The Odyssey of Fruitful embodies the eternal tug of war between the forces of fate and the spirited resilience of the human spirit. Just as the celestial orchestrations guided our protagonist through storms and celestial interventions, we too navigate the labyrinthine pathways of our lives, encountering challenges yet fueled by an indomitable spirit to rise above and reclaim our destiny. In the interplay of triumph and adversity, we discern the rhythm of existence, a symphony echoing the eternal truths woven into the fabric of our shared reality. It beckons us to embrace life's trials, not as obstacles, but as catalysts for growth, wisdom, and the unfurling of our latent potential. The cosmic harmony woven through these narratives invites us to consider the invisible threads connecting our actions to the greater cosmic dance, a reminder that each step we take resonates within the grand design of the universe. And as we bid adieu to the kingdom of Mithila and its illustrious ruler, King Fruitful, let us carry forth the essence of his journey, a beacon of resilience, wisdom, and ethical leadership. May we too embody these virtues as we navigate the tapestry of our own lives embracing the cyclical nature of existence with grace and fortitude. With deepest reverence for the wisdom within these ancient tales, let us depart, carrying with us the echoes of resilience, the whispers of destiny, and the gentle reminder that within every trial lies the seed of transcendence. Thank you, my dear friends, for gracing this narrative with your presence and allowing the wisdom of King Fruitful's tale to illuminate the pathways of our awakened souls. Until we meet again on this journey of contemplation and wonder,